The baby Mets, Francisco Alvarez and Brett Beatty, are thriving in the Mets starting lineup, leading us to wonder when another could join the party. When will Ronnie Mauricio be up in the big leagues? I'll discuss that on the show today, as well as a blowout victory in Chicago and preview what lies ahead as the Mets are set to take on the Colorado Rockies this weekend. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at FinkelsteinRyan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to RocketMoney.com slash LockedOnMLB. Now, the Mets had a great victory on Thursday, 10-1, beating up on the Chicago Cubs. And we'll get into the offensive stuff. I want to really get to what I think is the biggest headline from this game. And since the Mets got a good version of Carlos Carrasco, and boy, could they use that going forward. They need Cookie to be the guy from last year because you know he might not go out there every time and give you a chance to win. But if he gives you performances like this, Two out of every three times, three out of every five times even, where you're getting the better version of Carlos Carrasco where he can give you six plus innings like he did in this one, going six and two thirds and allowing just one. That's going to really help this rotation because as much as, you know, I've appreciated the effort that the Mets have gotten from Tyler McGill this year, you know, I think Carlos Carrasco is a guy you could depend on in the back end of that rotation more because he has a bigger track record of doing it. He's got... All the big league experience in the world. And if he figures out his stuff. And his changeup looks as good as it did today. In particular. Because everything works off Cookie's changeup. But also the curveball he was mixing in. If he can find a pitch mix that works with him. And and he can use that. And he can outthink hitters again. He's a good pitcher. And, And he can really give you some quality outings. And I'll tell you. Some of the best games last year were pitched by Carlos Carrasco. And this tonight was one of the best games the Mets have had all season. I mean, this was a really well-pitched ball game. And what's interesting is he threw changeup more than fastball, which we haven't seen him do enough this year, honestly. And also, he really went to the curveball in a way he hasn't since his first start this year. I don't know if he was kind of going away from that curveball because it's a matchup thing. It's not a pitch that he always really leans on. He usually is more you know, changeup, fastball, slider, sinker. Um, But this year, his sinker, for whatever it's worth, it's also tough sometimes because what's a sinker, what's a fastball, what's Savant picking up? You know, the the, the pitch tracker, is it just the same pitch or is there a a big difference between the sinker and the fastball? For what is worth this year, though, Carlos Carrasco's sinker is being hit to the tune of a 648 average. That was before tonight, but he didn't throw any sinkers tonight based on the pitch tracking. So maybe that's something they've identified, that that sinker is just a pitch he should stay away from, and he should go more fastball changeup and mix in the off-speed. But the thing is, usually it's more slider. Tonight it was 22 curveballs, 10 sliders. So I I don't know um, if that was a conscious decision, if that's just how, for this specific team, um, things sort of broke for him. But that curveball tonight got a lot of whiffs, got four whiffs on 13 swings. I believe he got some strikeouts on the pitch. I can think of one with Dansby Swanson in particular. Um, and he was getting whiffs with his changeup and he was getting soft contact. And, you know, that was Carlos Carrasco at his best, the way he pitched tonight. So you get that type of performance from him, and it's going to kind of set the tone for this team. And, you know, offensively early, it wasn't kind of a route from the beginning. It was one of those games where the offense over time, you know, inning by inning, builds on it and gets better and gets to the point where they break the game open late. The Mets drew first blood, uh, which is rare for this team. Brett Beatty, sack fly in the first inning, where the Mets probably should have scored more. But regardless, 
Uh, they got one. Cubs answer quickly. Dansby Swanson homer. Third inning, though, the Mets were able to string together a two-out rally. Jeff McNeil, Pete Alonso both getting hits. Brett Beatty driving in McNeil. Starling Marte drove in two with a base knock. And then he stole second base's 14th of the year before Daniel Vogelback looked at strike three on the outside corner. A fastball just looks at it. Uh, not a great day for him, although he did get a hit late and scored a run. Fifth inning. Mets were able to score when Jeff McNeil stole third and a throwing error brought him home. Seventh inning, two-run homer for Alonso, his 19th of the year. Ridiculous stuff from Pete right now. Uh, he's going to get to 20 maybe this weekend, uh, which would be before June. That's always a pretty impressive mark to hit. Uh, eighth inning, though, the Mets were able to, to rally. Uh, you had... Uh, the Vogelback hit, you had uh, a double from Alvarez, which moved Vogelback from first to third. Um, so you had second and third for uh, you know, Nemo, who tripled. I've said in the past that you have to triple home Vogelback from first. This instance, you tripled him home from third. Uh, also, of course, scoring Alvarez, and then Nemo came across on a base hit from Lindor. The lineup as a whole, 15 hits in this one. You look up and down, a lot of big days. You had Nemo go two for six. Couple runs scored, couple RBIs. Lindor salvaged his day with that RBI hit late. Otherwise, uh, he was one for five altogether, so that hit was the big difference for him. McNeil, three for four, three runs scored, drew a walk. Pete Alonzo, two for two with two walks. Uh, he had two runs scored, two RBIs, of course, on the homer. Beatty, one for four, a couple of RBIs and a run scored. Marte, two for five couple of RBIs. Vogelback had the run scored um, on that hit late. Uh, one for three day for him. Canna, one third for five. Struck out a couple of times. And then Alvarez batting in that nine hole. Two for five. Run scored in that eighth inning. Just a complete performance by the Mets offensively. Great to see. And with Carlos Carrasco pitching the way he did, a rare easy watch for this Mets team, uh, which does not happen often. But the question now remains, how do you get consistency moving forward? And there is a prospect that fans are calling for. That's Ronnie Mauricio. Today is Friday. We like to do Friday farm reports here. So what I want to do in the next segment is discuss, for one, the playing time of the current Baby Mets and when the next one will join the party. We'll discuss that in a minute. Before we do, today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs, the most comfortable shorts ever that are versatile. You can wear them in so many places. Find a pair that fits for you to wear out to dinner at night, to wear on the golf course, to wear lounging at home. You're going to love the way you feel in bird dogs. You're going to love the way you look in bird dogs. If you want to try these amazing shorts today, go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB and use the promo code locked on MLB to receive a free Yeti style tumbler with every order. Again, Go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. Use the promo code locked on MLB. You're going to get that free Yeti style tumbler. The New York Mets will play the Colorado Rockies at 8.40 p.m. Eastern Time tonight. If you want to catch every pitch of the Mets' hometown broadcast, you can with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Mets. Now, the handling of the baby Mets. It is a uh, conversation every day. The lineup card comes up. You see a Daniel Vogel back in it. You see Mark Vientos on the bench. There's uproar on Twitter. Rinse and repeat. We're seeing this a lot right now. The Mets are in a tough spot. There's no doubt about it. They have too many mouths to feed, is what I've said before. I know a lot of people say, look, it's clear, just feed the young mouse, okay? Feed the hungry baby Mets and, and let them take you to the promised land. And when it comes to Alvarez and Beatty, I really don't have any qualms about their playing time. Sure, I know I've seen some say, why is Alvarez batting ninth? But maybe Buck Showalter found something he likes, and Alvarez is hitting great in the nine hole. And I know, I guess, kind of popular belief would be, hey, get him in there earlier in games. Also, though, if you have your starting catcher batting ninth, it does a couple things for you. For one, it allows him to really get into the feel of the game behind the plate without really having to hit in that first inning. Okay, so that's 
a benefit, right? Young catcher who has a lot on his plate. The other thing, he's got Brandon Nimmo protecting him right now. So I feel like he's getting good pitches to hit. So I know a lot of people have been on the Alvarez moving up thing. I love it. I love it. They just hit Alvarez fifth and lead into the fact that he's probably the best power bet on this team outside of Alonzo. But maybe you get to that point and pitchers are going to be a little bit more tough on him the way they're pitching a Brett Beatty. And maybe he doesn't handle that as well. I don't know. So I'm not too mad at it. To me, as long as he's catching at least two games in every series and is catching, you know, five times a week, I'm happy, right? Um, you know, at least four, hopefully five, right? You know your backup catcher's going to get in there. To me, that's great. That's gravy, okay? And there's already a step in the right direction as Gary Sanchez was DFA because, boy, did he look atrocious as a catcher behind the plate. Nito was ready. Call Nito up, and there you go. So, I'll not call him up, bring him back um, off the injured list. So now it's Nito and Alvarez again. The Mets might have a tough decision when Revise is ready to come back. They could go three catchers, or maybe they're going to have to do something with with Nito. We'll, we'll find out when we get to that. But I think at this point, Alvarez has earned that starting catching job. I don't think he's going anywhere. Brett Beatty, same thing at third base. And boy, is he playing a great defensive third base on top of you know, producing offensively. But some of the plays he made in this game in particular, the one where he backhanded it, he was on the outfield grass, and, and he made that strong throw. Um, the one where it was another backhand, I believe, and, you know, a really tough play that he had to, you know, one hop to first base, and it gave Pete the easy long hop. He looks incredible over there defensively. Um, a, a huge addition, honestly. So having him and Lindor on that side of the infield is a big boost to this Mets team. Those are the baby Mets that I feel like we kind of know what we're going to get for the rest of the season. These guys are starters. Now, you get to the other ones, Mark Vientos. And you're in this position where he's not getting run, which is why earlier in the year it was like we understand why he's in triple because they're not playing him. you got to play him. And I get not DFAing Daniel Vogel back. But I also think it gets to a certain point where you got to Put him on the bench and let Vientos hit a little bit. As I've talked about on numerous occasions now, 12 of the 14 home runs that Mark Vientos has hit this year between AAA and the big leagues. It's one of the big leagues, 13 and triple, against right-handed pitching. He can hit righties. they got to get him in the lineup more. And that's where we get to Ronnie Mauricio. When will the last baby Met join the party? I don't know where the Mets are, are you know, most looking to fit in Ronnie Mauricio. Do they think he's ready right now? Are they concerned still about some of the play discipline stuff? I, I really don't know. Here's what I can tell you. And this was pulled from Arm Layton, um, who works, of course, with me at Just Baseball, really good prospect analyst. He, I asked him today to pull chase rates, and he tweeted this out. Uh, chase rates for Ronnie Mauricio in April, 40%. He was a 327 hitter, 370 on base, 604 slug. Strikeout rate was 20%. Chase rates in May down to 29%. So that's he cut that cherry rate by 11%. That has led to a cut in his strikeout rate by 10%. His strikeout rate in May has been 10%. He's hitting 386 in May, 409 on base, 602 slug. He is forcing the Mets' hand a little bit. The problem, though, is where do you play him? Answer would be second base. He's almost exclusively playing second base now. So they're clearly trying to get him ready. What did I tell you dating back to last season when we were talking prospects with Ronnie Mauricio? For the longest time, I've told you when Ronnie Mauricio is moved off shortstop and is playing other positions, that's when we're going to have an indication that the Mets view him as a piece of their big league club. He's playing second base. They've tipped their hand. They showed you where they see him, and they showed you where... At some point this year, they expect him to be starting, in my opinion. Because with these prospects, the Mets had the benefit of maybe not having to trade for any position player this year. They might get all the boosts they need from the kids. And you can get to a point where Ronnie Mauricio is your starting second baseman, where Mark Vientos is your DH, where Brett Beatty is your third baseman, and where Francisco Alvarez is your starting catcher, and Jeff McNeil is out in the outfield. And that's the best version of this team. When you can go one through nine with Nimmo, 
Lindor, McNeil, Alonzo, Beatty. Maybe at that point, we'll probably still be Marte. We'll see if he can hit at some point this year. Um, you know, string together some extra base hits and be the guy from last season. From there, you go, you know, Vientos, Mauricio Alvarez. <laughs> it's a loaded lineup. So I, I love to see them get to that point. Um, the question is, how do you get there? How do you manipulate this roster and, and put yourself in a position to call Ronnie Mauricio up? Here's what the guy's done this year all together. He's hit 351, 383 on base, 593 slug. 22 doubles to lead the minor leagues, two triples, seven home runs, 976 OPS. I'm not even sure what he did tonight, if Syracuse played tonight. I'll look that up in the break here and tell you what he did tonight and then tell you how I think you can get him on the roster, what has to happen, and when it will happen, just based on my best guess. We'll get to that in a minute. Before we do, today's episode is brought to you by Rocket Money. Try it for free for 30 days. You've heard it before, just enough time to try it, but then guess what happens? You forget about it. All of a sudden, you're paying that subscription fee for the next two years. You could be wasting money and not even realizing it. Rocket Money helps you find those forgotten subscriptions so you can stop paying for the ones you don't use. Most Americans think they spend $80 a month on subscriptions. In reality, it's closer to $200. You need to know... The money that you're spending each month in Rocket Money is there to help. It's a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 per year. Stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash lockedonmlb. That's rocketmoney.com slash lockedonmlb. rocketmoney.com slash lockedonmlb. The Mets play the Colorado Rockies at 8.40 p.m. Eastern Time tonight. Catch every pitch of the Mets' hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app. Just search Mets. Now, Ronnie Mauricio uh, tonight, and this is courtesy of Mike Mayer. You can find him at Mike Mayer 22 on Twitter. Unbelievable resource for the Mets, in particular the minor league um, players on the Mets or in the Mets' farm system. Tonight, one for four with a walk. Ronnie with a walk, we love that. I should have noted that um, in his stats here on April and May. I'll get to that in a second. But he also made his 11th error of the season, 6th in 24 games at second base. He's been on base in 16 straight games. So, first, I just alluded to the walks. April, he had 23 strikeouts to 5 walks. And again, remember the chase rate, 40% chase, 20% strikeout rate. May... Four, I guess now five walks and one intentional walk. Nine strikeouts. I'm not sure. Mayor's tweet didn't say if he struck out tonight. But the point is he cut the strikeouts. He is walking a little bit more. Um, Not a lot more, I guess. Five walks in April. Five walks in May. But there's still time for him to add a couple more. Um, The bottom line, though, is he's hitting. But the fielding thing is something. I do believe that Ronnie Mauricio, as a guy that was able to answer a lot of questions at shortstop uh, over the last couple of years, particularly last season, showing a lot of improvements, second base is still new to him. And he's a big guy, you know, as far as managing his footwork on that side of the bag. And it, it could take some time. So, I, as much as I'd love to see Ronnie Mauricio up at the Mets. Uh, you know, against the Phillies. And there was some random account on Twitter that said he's going to be there. And how much are we really taking? Because the guy got a couple right. We're assuming that this is the accurate thing, that when the Mets play the Phillies at home, you're going to see Mauricio. Maybe you are. Maybe you are. And the Mets, look at him hitting, you know, close to 380 in May or over 380 in May. And they say, look, we can't hold this guy back anymore. The bat's going to play too much. Let's bring him up. But the defense is still something that they're, going to iron out, and it's something they can still point to as something he has to check off developmentally before you call him. Eduardo Escobar is also playing well. And I think the Mets need to figure out which veterans are going to stay and make up this bench if they're going to lean heavily into baby Mets. What's the bench look like? Tommy Pham, Mark Canna. 
I don't think you can have both of them on the same roster because their skill sets overlap too much, particularly if they're on the same bench, right? Fan probably gives you more power and speed. Canna gives you better defense and on base. Canna has the bigger contract. Canna's been in that locker room for longer. It would feel really strange to me for the Mets to DFA Mark Canna. Just don't see them doing it. Tommy Pham, new to the party, I think he's one answer, right? So let's say you, you make that option. Let's just say maybe that report's right. Ronnie Mauricio comes up for that series against the Phillies. You DFA Pham, you call it Mauricio. All right, well, now what's your bench? Mark Canna, Eduardo Escobar, Daniel Vogelback, Mark Vientos, essentially, with your backup catcher, and you guys still have the DH mixed in there. Can is your fourth outfielder. Escobar's your utility infielder, backup catcher, and you have two DH types. Could work. Could work. Still think you get to a point this season where I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you would want, and I will say Ronnie Mears will be your backup shortstop too, which is a benefit of this. But I don't know exactly where the pieces fit bet fit bet geez fit best on this Mets team. Um, I think they're still buying time here, and to me, it's imperative more than figuring out the veterans is to figure out what you have with the kids, and keeping Mauricio and AAA for now to figure out the defense. Probably wise. Keeping Mauricio in AAA for now so he's not losing playing time to Jeff McNeil, to Eduardo Escobar, to Mark Canna, to Tommy Pham, to Daniel Vogelback, to Mark Vientos. I mean, obviously, they don't all play the same position, but Buck trying to squeeze nine guys into the lineup, there's a roster crunch. And the last thing I want to see is Ronnie Mauricio, a guy that has so much to work on and so much raw talent, to not play every day. The reason why Ryan Mauricio has taken this leap that he has is because he played winter ball and he's just getting a ridiculous amount of plate appearances under his belt. And he is in this zone where he's been seeing pitching pretty much nonstop from the start of 2021, you know, well, until now, but really particularly the start of the 2022 season with the expansive time he took in the Winter League this year. Played a little bit of the Winter League year, year prior, but not as much. So from what he did, Winter League, you know, 2022 season, double A, leading into Winter League, leading into spring training, leading into triple A, it's the playing time that has got him at this place where he's improving so drastically. The last thing I want to see is the Mets call him up and Buck Showalter puts him on the pine. So that's where we're at with all that. Um, I think he is part of this team, though. I, I do think that. I think that there is, of course, the conversation about being able to trade him, but... I think that the Mets might see this this new future developing around these four young players. And they're looking at a brave team they're trying to compete with that has a young core. And they're like, wow, we might have one on, on the cusp here. And the baby Mets could be here to stay. And the last baby of the group, who is he the youngest baby? Is he younger than Alvarez? I'll, I'll check that on another podcast. I think it's pretty close. Um, I think he might be a little bit older. But regardless... He's going to be up at some point this season. If I had to guess when, I think sometime around the All-Star break. But I would not be shocked at all. Whenever the Mets pull the trigger, I'd be like, okay, it's time. I just hope that when he gets the call, he's playing every day. I did not really preview the Rockies series very much, but we just saw the Colorado Rockies, a team that has some promising players now and could always come up and bite you as they did against the Mets recently. But... To the Mets' benefit, you got Scherzer and Verlander opening up this series. Uh, So you hope that you can do the hard work early. You win those two games, have a little three-game winning streak heading into Sunday. You at least ensure a 500 week, and then you throw Tyler McGill back out there at Coors Field and hope that you can bash your way to a victory then. Um, I'll be back on Monday to cover it all. And, of course, I always leave the caveat on that one for all you everydayers that Saturday podcasts happen when the Mets do special things on Friday night. So if something happens we want to talk about, make sure you're following, rating, reviewing, and you're checking out the channel uh, on Saturday morning just in case uh, something good happened. Otherwise, I will see you all on Monday. Uh, Make sure you follow me on Twitter, Finkelstein Ryan, and you can follow the show, Locked on Mets.